Ladies and gentlemen, lovers of peace, lovers of justice, humanity, we'd like to give you a human rights valentine on this Valentine's Day of Wednesday, the 14th of February, 2012, during the Great Black History Month, but we know that black history is every month. In fact, it's African history, it's Afro-Latino history, it's diasporan history, it's everybody's history. We're the original people, the first people, the only people the creators of civilization and everything therein. Without further ado, this is part two of our interview with Ricardo Jones, the former senior uh, federal investigator for the EEOC, as well as a retired master sergeant of the U.S. Army. And he is also the chairman of the Coalition for Change, which is an organization of persons who are trying to redress injustice in the federal and uh, uh, state and local workplace. What you're about to hear is the second part. This is Dignity, uh, a Dignity Report, in association with Education for Peace. We want to take a moment out to recognize our First Lady of Struggle, Miss Cynthia McKinney, who has commissioned that we do this report. Uh, in the second part, Mr. Ricardo Jones, Sr., he will be discussing major problems and cleavages around the issues of color, colorism, casteism, and internalized racism and black self-hatred, which is an impediment to our survival as a people. He's giving it from his vantage point of having worked within the EEOC, as well as his experience in the military, and also as an observer of what's going on in our community. We give our rare disclaimer in as much as we want all the opinions voiced his opinions are his own, even if we have those thoughts in common. We are not speaking on behalf of dignity or education for peace, but we absolutely endorse his bravery, his prescient understanding of what he sees, and therefore, without further ado, I want to have Mr. Ricardo Jones Sr. share his observations as a uh, highly respected investigator for the EEOC for 10 years to talk about the internal dimensions of colorism and self-hatred on behalf of African Americans who seem to be working against the advancement and betterment of their own kind. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity again to speak out on the uh, conspiracy against African Americans and foreign-born blacks that's being perpetrated at the EEOC and a good number of the other so-called civil rights agencies at the federal government level. Um, the, the, the issue is that uh, it seems as if that we as black people basically have some form of self-hate. And in this self-hate, what is going on is, is that in the federal government, we, we are oppressing ourselves. Um, the system that existed before we became so high up in the levels of federal government or is prominent in the federal government is uh, that we we are now complaining to our own people so but the 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 um, what I call the um, plan that is being used against us as black people in the federal government is the same plan that had been used for a long time they use Native Americans to uh, basically do away with Native Americans. They use Jews to help herd Jews into the uh, crematorias and the, uh, the gas chambers. So they are now using African Americans against other African Americans. And the rationale for that is, is that a black person can't say that another black person is discriminating against them because they look like them. So what has happened is, is because we, we have a president that is a president of color, we can't complain about the discriminatory practices that are being done by the Obama administration because it looks as if black people are complaining about a black president who is discriminating against them. You can't really say it's race discrimination, but it is race discrimination. And we really have a serious problem because many blacks are afraid to point out the fallacies in the Obama administration. 
I mean, he is the president of the United States and he represents all Americans, but aren't we as black people Americans? The 13th Amendment to the Constitution uh, freed us from slavery. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution gave us the rights of citizenship, but we don't get to receive the full benefits and privileges of citizenship in this country as, as citizens. The federal government is the biggest violator of our constitutional rights as, as anyone. So what, what we have to understand is, is that when we have corrupt black people in positions, whether it's from the lowest government position to the highest government position, which is the executive uh, CEO of the United States, the chief executive, if the chief executive is doing a bad job, we must hold the chief executive accountable. And just because we like the chief executive, which is Barack Obama at this time, doesn't mean that he gets a pass just based on his color. And basically, many of us African Americans and foreign-born blacks, because we're happy with the um, illusion of change and the um, um, appearance of change, and uh, the um, you know we we're giving President Obama a pass. He's not being held accountable. First of all, we have to hold him accountable, and if we don't hold him accountable, then he won't live up to the duties and the responsibilities of his position. Mr. Jones, I have two questions as you mentioned this. Do you find it curious that there is some recognition of something called black-on-black -black crime, but there seems to lack a sense of black-on-black -black discrimination or self-hatred? It seems as if uh, the law does not represent the reality. Of course, we didn't write the laws, and the laws aren't written for our benefit, so there, would you agree there seems to be a lack of precedent cases to even redress through the courts situations where perhaps a person is being discriminated against because they are darker or lighter or have a certain texture of hair or whatever? Do, what, what would you say to that? Well, that, that's the crux of the problem, right, is uh, we, we, we've been divided from the day of slavery. I mean, once we were brought to this country and once the slave masters decided to go down into the slave corner, uh, quarters and, and basically rape black uh, slaves and have children with black slaves, then, then we, we, we were produced into this um, mulattoized uh, society. And then those offspring of the master were given more privileges than the other slaves. Are you saying that you still see this uh, going on now? Yes, it's still going on today. And I think it's come to the ultimate flourishing. Because now we have a black-looking president that knows nothing about being black. You know, I mean, playing basketball and smoking marijuana at Columbia University doesn't make you a black person. I don't think that the president really has any idea of his ethnicity or what it means to really be black. I mean, he grew up in Hawaii, and I don't know if you can really understand the black experience growing up in Hawaii to a white mother and a white grandmother and a white grandfather. Do so, you think that he may have, that, do you think he has any exposure to the indigenous Hawaiian culture? Certainly, if he had that, that may give him some sense of being and a depressed class. Do you think he has any connection to the people of color in Hawaii? I think that uh, the president, in his experience that he received in Malaysia, which was a very discriminatory Indonesia, uh, Indonesia okay. was a very discriminatory environment that he, he was exposed to. I mean, there's some information that I was given that the president wanted to find a bleach screen, a bleach cream. He's saying President Obama, Obama as a youngster had a desire to be lighter? To bleach his skin lighter. And the rationale behind that is in Asia, if you're white, then you're almost like a god. But being the child, the uh, black child of a white woman and an individual from, from Kenya, right, um, would not be a god. So his mother is being treated as a goddess and he's being treated as a, a, a lower race individual. I want to change uh, focus for just one second. You focused uh, attention on President Obama, but there are other people in his administration. Uh, do you think that there's a, a different case for the uh, first uh, black 
Attorney General, Mr. Eric Holder. Do you believe perhaps he's someone that does have a, he grew up in the United States, do you believe that he has a strong sense of identity? Or how would you assess his performance? Well, I, I, I've since learned that uh, um, Eric Holder is of Trinidadian descent, right? Barbadian. I Barbadian, think. okay, he's Barbadian descent. Mm -hmm. But many of the Caribbean islands have what they call a system, a caste system, right? Where in this caste system, it's based on your social position in, in the community. And if you're light, then the lighter people receive better treatment and better privileges than the darker people. Do you think that Eric Holder comes from the uh, group that's the beneficiary of being lighter? or Because there are many people in some societies in Latin America or the Caribbean where you're not necessarily doing that much better if you're lighter, but are you suggesting that maybe Eric Holder comes from that class in Barbados? I, I believe that uh, he, he's one of those individuals that uh, you can look at his features and it's his hair, his facial features, his nose features, his lips features that would have been in the higher level of that caste society in, in the West Indies. And this is a well-documented fact that, that their social support network for uh, people who are lighter and straighter hair and finer features got them certain privileges that darker people with not so fine uh, features and not so straight hair didn't receive. And uh, that system has kind of evolved here in the United States also. So it's not just Eric Holder. If you look at the Obama administration, there are many people there who have interracial uh, marriages, that they are half white or married to white, they're blacks married to, to whites or whites married to blacks, and that they have been mixed with their half caste. I think in Australia they, they call it half caste. So we, we've created a new race of people which is the half caste. But the half caste seem to have become the ruling class, right, of the black, of black people. Of, so of black people, okay. So you're not saying for America. Uh, what I think I'm getting from this is you're saying that there is like an intermediary mixed group that basically is in charge of making certain that uh, people of African descent in the United States are kept in place. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, yes. Now, I want to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, do you see any parallels in, say, some of the civil rights groups, for instance, maybe the NAACP, do you see yes. any? Yes, Could you elaborate on, on that? Yes. Uh, I think if you take a hard look at uh, the uh, head of the NAACP, the president, I guess his name is Benjamin Gillis, I mean, obviously, he, he is an individual that has the appearance that he's uh, really not black, that he's mixed. And, I mean, I know in Louisiana and some southern states, they, they call them the passe blanc. And he obviously is passe blanc. That means he can pass the paper bag test. For those of you who don't know the paper bag test, if you darken in a paper bag, you can't marry anybody. I mean, if you, if you darken in a paper bag, you can't marry anybody lighter than a paper bag. And that means to receive privileges, you have to be lighter than a paper bag. Because if you're darker than a paper bag, then you're in the bag group of black people. But if you're lighter than the paper bag, or as light as the paper bag, then you're in a good group of black people. And you'll be afforded more privileges and social status, and you will be bred only with people of your same uh, color uh, shades. Last year... Uh the famous actor Wesley Snipes was, uh, for a, a, a minor crime, a misdemeanor, given a three-year sentence for uh, paying taxes late. Uh, do you think, in his case, had he been a lighter-skinned actor, either his case, his sentence would have been lighter, or, and or, perhaps it would have been greater outrage from the African-American community. Do you ever sense? I, I do. I'm going to give another individual, the athlete, Plasico Burris. I mean, um, basically in New York, he went into the Latin Quarter. He took a pistol with him into the Latin Quarter, which didn't make any sense. And he didn't have a holster. It fell through his pants, and he shot himself in the leg. Now, um, I know he's a very high-paid wide receiver for the New York Giants, which won the Super Bowl this year. But uh, Mayor Bloomberg made sure that he went to prison for two years. What did he look like? He was a dark-skinned, tall, African-American. Okay, and can you give me an example of someone fair-complected that you think got a break? 
Well, I mean, I, I can't give you a, a specific example of a light-skinned person that got a break, but the, the, the uh, premise is, is that black people and the darker people are the worst of the black people. You know, when I was a kid growing up here in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to be honest with you, you had people that we would say were the purple people. They were really dark. I mean, dark. I mean, they had a candy here that we used to call, it was called Black Sambo, right? Now, that's a strange name to have a piece of candy, but this candy was like a licorice Ed, that was so dark that when you put it in your mouth, your teeth turned black, jet black. But the people in, in, there were some black people that I don't even see anymore that were really, really dark, and they were beautiful. But what happened to all those really dark, dark black people? You don't see them anymore, so they've been bred out. Or do they, are they the people that end up on drugs or in prison? Uh, I'm going to ask you, perhaps you worked uh, to some degree in investigations. Did you ever notice, perhaps, when you go to a courthouse or a jail, that the color scheme of African Americans tends to lean towards the darker side? Yes. I mean, same thing for education. If there is a school that isn't as good or the slower classes, there might be a... the academic attainment or where these people are situated tends to be color-coded, perhaps? The, the, the perception is darker people are more threatening and more violent, right? Uh, so Is it also that perhaps they're more ignorant because they're less white? Is that a factor you suspect? I, I think that the ruling class and white society and are threatened. And a, a black ruling class also, too. And the black ruling class also, too, believes that the lighter you are, or if you're half white, that you are the uh, chosen group. And we're, we're supporting that today. And the real problem is that we buy into that. So, uh, I mean, a black female that is dark will probably not end up married to a lighter black male, right? She would want to, to lighten up her color, but she probably would have a hard time. So we, we, we perpetuate this against ourselves there. We buy into this game. I'm going to give you an example. It's really, really a tough example there. I mean, uh, I, I, I was dating a, 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 a mixed college professor at, at a major Abbey League university. And um, she, her mother was white and her father was black. And, um, I mean, she could pass for being white. But she uh, basically said that she was black. Well, the truth of the matter is she, she's a black conservative. She doesn't believe in civil rights or she doesn't believe in equal treatment for black people at all. She has a conservative view. And I think that's basically because she gets more privileges and treated better because she is almost white. And um, she... Do you know other people that you've witnessed that share the same, or is she unique in your opinion? I don't think she's unique. I think she's a supporter of President Obama because her and President Obama share a similarity that his mother is white and her mother is white. So she supports Obama, and if he treats black people bad, then she feels that it's okay because, uh, you know, her mother is white and his mother is white, and I receive benefits because I'm half white, but even though I say I'm black because I get privileges, but the reality is uh, it's not about really black people. Even though her thesis is on African American studies, she, she doesn't really believe that uh, black people should be treated equally. Okay. And the university accepts her, and she's probably in her position because uh, she's next to the best uh, white person that they can get. And plus, she's black, so she kind of makes a lot of quotas. She says she's black, her father is black, her mother is white, and she's non-threatening. And when she was faced with, with some discrimination, because they still discriminate against her because she says she's black, right? So, But when she was faced with it and had to make a complaint, a file a grievance, and they retaliated against her... She caved in and ran away. And after she ran away, she just decided that she's going to accept all forms of discrimination against black people as that's just the way it is. So now here's an individual that is shaping the minds of, of college graduates who are shaping the minds of public school children, right? That it's all right to accept racism and bigotry because we can't do anything about it. And that's just the way it is because she's afraid to stand up to fight for her blackness that she benefits from, but uh, she doesn't like the fact that people pick on her because uh, um, she's not really all the way white. But black people pick on her because she's not all the way black. 
So that's why I say we've created this new mulatto group of people who basically are saying, you know what, I can favor my white side and stay on the right side of the white people and I can pretend that I'm black, but the reality is white people would rather have me around than to have dark black people around. And those people in this current administration seem to be doing very well. And if you take a look at the people in the, the, the people of color in the Obama administration, they fit that category. Now, I think that there's something seriously wrong that's going on in this society when uh, people who are mixed of color will turn on their own people to receive a benefit and feel that there's nothing ethically or morally wrong with discriminating against their own people so that long as they receive a benefit. Let me ask you a question. You're a native of New York. You grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I believe that you remember Marion Barry. Yes. Have you followed the mayors that have followed Marion Barry? Yes. Uh, can you describe their appearance? They're all lighter than Marion Barry. Most of them passed the paper bag test. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the mayors of uh, New Orleans, Mayor Nagin is in the Passe Blanc. And, and before? And before him was Muriel. And Muriel is in the Passe Blanc. Now, the question is, why is it that the only way in certain major metropolitan cities that you can get ahead is that you have to be a light-skinned uh, African-American that can pass the paper bag test? Uh, Newark? Is the same thing. It's the paper bag test. So the paper bag test that has been used in the Deep South is now been brought up to the north and the northeast. Governor of Massachusetts. Same thing again. It's the paper bag test. I mean, you don't see any dark people. I think the last really dark mayor was uh, uh, the mayor of Chicago. I think he was uh, uh, Mayor uh, of Washington. Was the last really dark, dark mayor that, that we've had in, in, in the United States. For a major city. For a major city. So what is happening is, it, you, know, you know, intelligence, ability, an opportunity is based on how light you are, you know, and it's not just light anymore. It used to be that if you were light and passed a paper bag test, now you have to be half. You have to be half white and half black. That seems to be the, um, the, the group that is the prime group because they can kind of ride the fence both ways and, and they can benefit from both sides. But they don't benefit from both sides. They benefit from the power side, which is white. And because they're half white, white people will accept them more than anybody else. And they feel safe with them. And they, 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 they receive the benefit by putting the black side of themselves down. So The Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, do you know the current head? No. No, I don't. I looked that up. That, mm -hmm. that may mm -hmm. fit within your mm -hmm. understanding of what's happening. Uh, I wanted to just ask you to talk a little bit more about the internal dynamics that you witnessed. I don't know, maybe you witnessed it in the military. Did you see uh, colorism or black self-hatred within the military, or was that a place that there was more uh, equality? I, I, in the military, a lot of things are, 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 are covered up by rank. The discrimination and racism and bigotry is hidden through rank because you, you, you have a, 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 a rank based system there. But uh, again, you know, discrimination goes on in the military, but the military had a very good system of race relations that may, could apply in, in, in the civilian society. Basically, in the 70s, there was some major racial problem in the United States Army that, that I experienced, right? But how, how they dealt with it was they would put everybody in a room, right? We'd make a circle with chairs, and then you call each other the worst racial slurs that you could imagine. And the good thing about that was, right, what came out is, is once you got that all out, when we all left out of that room, we felt better, right? Because we got our frustrations, our racial hatreds out. And once it was out, we can walk out of that room and say, we got it off our chest. Now let's go to work and do whatever it is that we're assigned to do. So you're saying in the military, they have a solution to racial no, problems? No, no, they had a solution. But I want to equate that to this. What happened in South Africa when the apartheid regime toppled was, they had a thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. That means the worst, racist, bigoted, horrendous things that went on. If you came out and you confessed it, 
and you confessed everything and you asked for forgiveness, right? And you were tried by people of your peers, whether they were black, white, or whatever, then we can move forward. And that helped to move that society forward. We have never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in this country. Many of us thought that Obama had the moral courage to do that. But now, as we see, he has very little moral courage whatsoever. And he is favoring the white side of himself. But because he looks black and he's married to a black woman and he has black children, people say that he can't be criticized for his lack of civil rights for black people. I'm going to interject. Uh, I rarely uh, say things, but I think that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has challenges. Uh, in particular, I, I, my recollection is uh, Sister Winnie Mandela every bit one of the greatest uh, women to have ever lived uh, was treated f with disrespect and yet uh, white heads of state, white policemen who murdered uh, had the option to refuse to even come but Miss Mandela who was unfairly accused of having something to do with one boy, I mean thousands of people died everyone was concerned about the one child that may have been killed as a result of people knowing her that killed this boy, and yet uh, de Klerk, the former head of state, uh, refused to show up. They, the whites literally had the option to opt out, and the blacks actually did jail time. Whites were set free. So I actually think that South Africa, just from having visited the country and looked around, still has major issues around that of race, the uh, reconciliation between the coloreds and the uh, black South Africans is not there. And the whites still have a disproportionate amount of the money in the country. And the big losers have been the poor blacks uh, who have replaced the apartheid regime with a thin crust of ANC functionaries with the same old white oligarchs. Uh, some Asians uh, who have been the biggest winners. And the coloreds. Uh, have lost alongside the black South Africans. So I, 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 I challenge people to look into that. I think South Africa is a powder keg uh, around these issues that have not really been resolved. Uh, and, and that's my take on that. I think uh, we've the same m massaging of Mr. Obama's image as the savior was applied to Mr. Mandela uh, I completely, and I think I, I can speak on behalf of dignity, the neoliberal economy in South Africa has been cruel and Malthusian against black South Africans, and it should be repudiated. Uh, uh, there's a need for that economy to be just. And I'm sorry I had to put that piece in. I, I would be remiss to not say we, we have real issues. We love South Africa. We love the people there. But the, the ANC uh, has not done uh, the best job. In fact, I think that they're getting the same sort of herd mentality voting from black South Africans that the Democratic Party has, where people are voting color without any return on their part. And a lot of that is around uh, color, colorism, tribe, and not unity and empowerment of the people. Uh, I'll stop there. I, I think what I'm trying to say is, is we need to use some examples, right? And it doesn't have to follow on the lines of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that okay. was in South Africa. Or it doesn't have to be the way that the Army did it in the 70s. We're no longer in the 70s and, and, and things have changed greatly now. But we need to deal with the issue of race in this country. And people like uh, Barack Obama and Eric Holder are, are playing uh, the, 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 the game of denying that there's a racial problem in this country. There has always been a racial problem in this country, and there always will be a racial problem in this country until we come out of denial about race discrimination in America. I think there are many white people that want to get some type of dialogue on race in this country. If the president had moral courage and he came into office, just like he dealt with the race issue with Jeremiah Wright, when he had a problem with Jeremiah Wright and, and racial issues, he dealt with them immediately. Many of us thought that he would do that with the rest of the country. And we were waiting for him to come out and start. Many white people were waiting for him to come out and start a dialogue on race. But as Eric Holder says, right, 
wherever he's coming from, that in America we are cowards when it comes to the race issue. That's the truest statement that he has ever made. And then he was forced or he recounted that statement. No, the president asked him, demanded that he take that back. Now, everyone's not a coward. There are people who have, at least in the past, members of Congress, uh, certain people who happen to be of African descent, who've spoken out in terms of racial justice and the need for change. Uh, but do you think that these people, say Maxine Waters or John Conyers or uh, Charles Rangel or, or other persons who've been uh, outspoken in the past, at least in their position as elected officials, that they have been received by the new leadership in the country? You know, um, I, I think if you look at Maxine Waters compared to Cynthia McKinney, then you, you're going to see a night and day difference, right? And you can see that Maxine Waters basically is trying to uh, portray herself or she, she, she kind of um, styles herself like a white woman. Because it's more acceptable and palatable. White woman in terms of... As far as her hair and her, 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 her way of uh, um, um, probably taking care of her, uh, um, her makeup and whatever and her dress, right? Because that makes it e easier for her to sell, you know, her agenda and stuff. But if you look at uh, Cynthia McKinney, then she's more or less portraying herself as an African woman and that she's proud. She had her hair in braids. She has dreads. And she has a more ethnic appearance, right? More See, ethnic. You're saying that Cynthia is a nice, dark-skinned woman. So her skin color and the way you described it makes her more ethnic to certain people. Well, yeah, but then you see Maxine Waters that she wants to look more European, right? Because if you are darker and you look European and you, you basically perm your hair and you, you know, kind of make yourself up like you're a, a dark European woman, white woman, in, in, but you're dark, then, you know, it's easier for you to get along. Now, Cynthia McKinney, uh, because she is proud that she is of African descent, and, and she's not ashamed, and she carries herself as an African woman should with proud dignity and proud of uh, her, her natural hair and her natural appearance, she's going to get more hostility than uh, Maxine Waters. And there's something wrong with that situation where we have to be something other than ourselves to get along. Do you think that Cynthia McKinney's treatment by the Congressional Black Caucus uh, would have been different had she been lighter skinned? Yes, and I think if she had permed her hair and she had a more European appearance, then she would be more acceptable. You can go to Wall Street. There's only a handful of black people that even work on Wall Street, but of the women that are black women or black men that are working on Wall Street, they're the ones that are either more lighter or they have straighter features or they wear themselves or carry themselves in a European appearance. Now, you don't see any uh, African-American women working on Wall Street that have dreads and dress in dashikis and, or African garb that are proud of who they are and where they come from in Africa that are working over there. So that's just a prime example of that. Hmm. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Why do we have to hate ourselves to be accepted? Why do we have to look like European women to be accepted? Did you have EEOC cases where you had internal racial dynamics working or hair? Did you ever uh, observe or investigate a case where perhaps you had a lighter supervisor? There was a case where there were two women that uh, it was a precedent case in the 90s where you had a light-skinned woman who was being persecuted by a darker supervisor. It was, I think, in 95, 96. Are you familiar or have you investigated or run across or heard of cases where the EEOC or some regulatory body at least tried to address this situation? Well, you know, most people at the EEOC don't understand that color discrimination is between black people, mainly between light-skinned black people and dark-skinned black people. Did you ever observe cases like this? Yes, there, 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 are, there are, are cases like that, but I mean, they're few and far in between, but they had a uh, chairwoman of the EEOC, a white Irish woman, that felt that the only race discrimination that was really going on in the country was, was between light-skinned blacks and dark-skinned blacks, and she said that clearly. 
very clearly. And you know, and she did that in, in front of a group of investigators, New York District Office. And I, I didn't understand where she's coming from. That how can you feel that the only real discrimination based on race was was light skinned blacks discriminated against dark skinned blacks or dark skinned blacks discriminated against light skinned blacks? I mean, I, I really, I'm, I'm really ashamed of myself that I didn't jump up in the room and say, how do you think the light skinned blacks got to be light skinned? That means the slave master went down into the quarter and raped the black African slaves and made them light skinned. So y your people started the problem in the first place. And now you're going to blame us because of all the problems that's going on because, you know, the white slave master had to go down and rape black slaves and cause this problem from the beginning. I need to revisit a comment you made before where the EEOC did as little as it could to deal with racial issues, which seems to be hypocritical if one of the directors will say that there is discrimination between blacks of different hues, but yet there is no effort to solve these problems. If this was a problem, it seems as if there would have been some effort or at least a precedent of cases that they had solved to create a legal precedent and statutes where persons could find a way to defend or seek redress when they have a problem. Uh, what do you say to that? That is the exact premise that I'm talking about. What she was attempting to do, this commissioner, and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, right? But she was from she was from an Irish, a white Irish family in Boston, right? Was to influence weaker black investigators and the few black lawyers that were at the EEOC to believe that the only racial issues in this country is, is against blacks on blacks. And so, if they believe that, uh, are you saying to me that? These folks decided since that was a deep problem, they didn't have to do anything about it. Well, they used that as an excuse to justify dismissing all African American complaints. I mean, I mean, if you're a weak-minded person, very weak-minded person, then you'll buy into her premise. Now, I'm not a weak-minded person, and I didn't buy into her premise because I can, I can see through it. It didn't hold any water in the first place, right? But if you are weak-minded and, and you can be influenced very easily, it's easy for a person who says, I just want to get paid to say, well, you know, this commissioner is saying that it's really us blacks discriminating against other blacks, and it ain't really white people discriminating against black people. So, you know, just, to, you know, all black people are playing a race card. And the premise at the EEOC from the legal point, point of view is that, that black people basically are just playing a race card, and that there is no more discrimination based on race. Or, my understanding, there's a quotation, you may be familiar with it. Congress has not authorized, either expressly or impliedly, a cause of action against the EEOC for the EEOC's alleged negligence or other malfeasance in processing and em uh, em em employment discrimination. This is a Smith v. Uh, Casillas, uh, 119 F3D. Um, this, is, this seems to be the legal doctrine by which they dismiss no, that's the legal doctrine which the EEOC uh, takes bribes, throws cases for friends, fix themselves with jobs at law firms, fix themselves up with jobs with corporations, undermine every complaint filed by an African American because they have a get out of jail free card. You can't take a causable action against the EEOC even if you catch them taking a bribe, throwing a case, intentionally messing up an investigation of an African American. There's no actionable uh, 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 clause or law that you can go after anybody for doing any impropriety at the EEOC. And they take that as a get out of jail free card. So, so this is a law that allows them to do that. Now, you mentioned the plethora of people who are lighter skin or mixed or whatever. Is the friend of the president's wife that you've described, is she of a fair hue or is she uh, more towards the Cynthia McKinney spectrum in terms of phenotype? All right, let me give you that in context. I'm talking about Jacqueline Barron. She's the chairwoman of the EEOC. Now, Jacqueline Barron's wasn't the first person that the Obama administration had uh, picked to, to be in charge of the EEOC. But I think the two or three other African-American females that they offered it to turned it down because they knew how corrupt the EEOC was. Were any of them dark? 
you know, they weren't really that dark. None of the ones they offered it to. I know they offered a job to Cassandra Butts, which was Rob Emanuel's chief of staff, but she was a little too smart to take that job because it's almost a trap, right? Because the corruption and the fraud is so bad at the EEOC that if you take that job, you, you almost limit, you know, your, uh, your, 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 your career opportunity, career. your career. I mean, it's considered a black seat. But the black seat is at the EEOC is a black seat is a front. Racist bigots run the EEOC, and Aunt Jemima's that I call or Uncle Tom's basically hold the front position. But they're being told what to do by white racist bigots, and and they go along with the game. Does and this sound like the presidency to you? Yes, yes, and I think what happened was is they couldn't find anybody who was not willing to go along with the corruption at the EEOC, so the first lady went to her Harvard Law School friend, which does not necessarily mean that she's righteous or she's qualified and, and, and that she's going to do the job and enforce the rule of law at the EEOC. But Jacqueline Barron's, because she was picked by, because she's a friend of the first lady and went to Harvard Law School with the first lady, cannot be held accountable. Because how could the president look over the table uh, uh, of the cabinet positions and say, Jackie, you know, you're doing a bad job. He can't do that because if he did that, then his wife would be mad at him because his wife picked her for that job. So there is no consequence if Jacqueline Barron's goes along with the fraud, corruption, and bribery that's going on and the conspiracy that's going on at the EEOC. She got a free pass also. So now we're seeing how a black administration or a black looking administration is just as corrupt as a white administration. So the reality is the president really is not acting as a righteous black person. He's acting like a racist, bigoted white person that looks black. And, and that to me is strange. Did you get any directives, for instance, when a new administration comes in, it lays out more or less its policy prerogatives. Were there any from the current administration that would lead someone to feel that they, their goal was to either keep things as they were under Bush or, uh, or change them or uh, retreat from certain stands? What You mentioned that the Bush administration wanted to teach uh, preventive, a, a preventative uh, a intervention. What's what's the doctrine of the Obama administration? Well, I got to be honest with you. You know, first of all, I was targeted because I wouldn't take bribes and I'm not an easily persuaded black person and I know about the rule of law and as I know, I joined the army during the 70s during the Vietnam era and I, I received some special training on no, knowing what a lawful order is and an unlawful order. Many people in the federal government don't know they don't have to follow unlawful orders. This came as a result of the My Lai Massacre. Those of us who are old enough to remember Lieutenant uh, Cali and, and Captain Medina who uh, basically uh, went into a village in Vietnam. They found no Viet Cong and they killed everybody in the village, men, women, and children, the cats, the dogs, the pigs, the cows, the chickens. They killed everything. Right? And that's not the only massacre. In that no, area. that's not the only time that it happened, but that was the only time there was a court martial. But there were seven soldiers, to include a few African Americans, that refused to participate in the murdering of these innocent villagers in Vietnam. Right? So, and guess, by the way, who helped in that investigation? Colin. Guess who, who was involved in that investigation and covered it up? Colin the, Powell. Colin Powell, a light skinned uh, Jamaican descent individual whose career rose to the tops because he helped cover it up. That uh, massacre in the Milai uh, 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 Milai village. And I want to stop you because you're talking about Vietnam, uh, and you mentioned uh, uh, the former uh, uh, Secretary of State Colin Powell, retired uh, Joint Chiefs of Ch Staff uh, Chair. Uh, you served in Vietnam. Are you familiar with the genocide that took place against the blacker Vietnamese? Uh, in the uh, hills of Vietnam, South Vietnam. Now, I, I didn't serve in Vietnam. I joined the army during the Vietnam era. But so you're not familiar with that. You know, I, I am a little so, familiar, so you're with, familiar that. with that. I am a little and, familiar and, with and that. You you know who served mm -hmm. in that period of time yes. where they were killing the Montagnards. Yes. Essentially, the Montagnards are a mixture of Negrito and Vietnamese. So these are darker, literally almost black-skinned Vietnamese. Who are about 12, 15 percent of the population of Vietnam, sound familiar, that were being killed uh, by 
both the Viet Cong and also being targeted by the South Vietnamese regime and American soldiers were essentially killing another group of, of black people and the same force that name, I won't repeat it, was heading a combat unit there. You're familiar with them. Yes, but let me put this in context again because I don't want to get too far away. I, Many I just people, want to put that out right, there. Many people, right, are not even old enough to remember what went on in Vietnam. I happen to, to remember what went on in Vietnam because we as African Americans and foreign born blacks were disproportionately drafted into the United States Army to go kill villagers and poor farmers in a, in a faraway country to, to, to basically protect Firestone and Goodyear. But that's another issue. The reason why I bring up the lawful order and the unlawful order, after the Milai massacre and the court martials of, of, of Lieutenant Calley and Captain Medina, and Colin Powell was actively involved in that, right? And one general by the name of General Richardson lost a star as a result of that, but it was given back to him later on. And right? Lieutenant Kelly was and Lieutenant Kelly was court martialed, and he had to go to jail in the prison. But and they released him early. And they released him early, and, and all the money he was lost was given to him by the Republican Party to pay back to him because they felt he was a good soldier for killing all the bad guys. Right? Is that what came out as a result of that when I joined the army was you did not have to follow an unlawful order if you felt it was unlawful or it was immoral. You could face the court-martial and not be shot because in combat, in the military, in war, if you fail to follow an order of your leader, you can be shot. You can be summary executed, right, for not following an order in combat. I mean, that's one of the consequences. But they found out that some of the orders were illegal. Most of the government workers don't know that you don't have to follow immoral or illegal orders. All orders are not lawful. So why do black government workers discriminate against their own people? Because they feel they're just taking what we call the Nuremberg defense. The Nuremberg defense is the defense that Germans, Nazi Germans, and most Germans took when uh, they killed uh, all the Jews during World War II. That I'm only following orders that Hitler told me to do it. Hitler gave me the order to do it. Hitler is the bad guy. I didn't want to do it. They gave me an order to do it. So I'm exempt from prosecution because I'm following orders. Well, that didn't work at the Nuremberg trials. They disciplined a lot of people. But many people took the Nuremberg defense. Many black people in the federal government do what they do to other black people because basically they say they're following orders and they feel they have to follow orders. Except that I went into the military as a result of the Milai massacre where they came out and they had trained us that you don't have to follow an unlawful order. So I know the difference between a lawful order, an unlawful order, and an immoral order. I want to elaborate a little bit more on, on, on this uh, lawful order and unlawful order and why it is that the black employees at the EEOC go along with the racist, bigoted treatment of other African Americans and foreign born blacks is because, because they can get away with uh, uh, doing their own people in because they're following orders. And as long as they're following orders, they'll continue to get paid, so it's all right to dismiss all the black complaints because all black people lie and all black people are playing the race card. So only 3.5% of all the complaints are valid complaints anyway. And the judges in federal courts and the lawyers in federal courts feel that enough affirmative action was done in the 70s and the 80s and enough quotas were done. And because we have a black-looking president, that there's no more racial problems in, in, in the United States. So reality is... Uh, 96.5% uh, of all the race complaints being filed by African Americans and foreign born blacks are just race, black people playing the race card. So th they have a right to steal, cheat, take bribes, throw cases, uh, make money off of the race playing cards of the lying African Americans because of the color of their skin. And because there is no statutes to go after them, and the president could fix that with an executive order like he did for Lily Ledbetter, the white woman that had an equal pay complaint. Um, then they're justified in doing this discriminatory practices and doing this fraud and corruption against black people because we're only playing the race card anyway. And there's no more real race discrimination in this country except for 3.5%. And, 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 and that's a joke. But that's how they justify doing what they're doing. And you got lawyers that are breaking the law. They have a fiduciary responsibility that they're not following. And uh, because we're all liars based on the color of our skins and they legitimately have a right to make money and um, do illegal things against people that are lying anyway.
And that's how they justify it. And the blacks justify it that they're only following orders. So why shouldn't I follow orders and get paid? Because we're lying and all black people lie. And so that's it. I wanted to uh, ask you, mm -hmm. at one point you were impressed by President Obama. So you had some anticipation that things, you would get some change and hope in the EEOC. How did you first feel when the new administration came in? Well, I, I was naive, you know, again, I was looking for a messiah too, and I was hoping that he was a young guy and he had moral courage and he would be able to deal with race head on and he wouldn't be afraid. He wasn't a step and fetch it person. That was my dream, right? But what I saw at the EEOC was, is the managers who are racist bigots, and that's most of them, and the directors and the chair people basically already had the inside information that Obama was soft on race discrimination. So they began to take out champagne and celebrate that they'd be able to really do damage to black people because Obama was elected? They sped up the damage that they had done to black people under Bush. They sped it up under Obama because they had already knew. When he was a senator and he was a junior senator, uh, I think that uh, Sam Wright Jr. had went to him and exposed his fraud and corruption at the EEOC and what Obama and his people said as a junior senator from Illinois that he didn't want anything to change. So if he didn't want anything to change as a senator, what would he do once he became president? So no change in hope for the EEOC in terms of race relations from Obama before he became president. And certainly none has happened since, is what you're saying. Yes, but he did, uh, if you Google some of the uh, stance, and you know Obama was on the Senate committee that oversaw the EEOC. You know, these things don't really come out all the time. He was on the subcommittee for workplace safety. So he was the only black person that was on the committee that oversaw the EEOC. Did, did anything happen good? Did he do anything with that? I think he challenged one commissioner the whole time, that, and you know he wasn't there long because you know he but became the, president, but, but, so right? He did exactly one. He challenged time. one commissioner that had been known to be uh, kind of biased against black people. So he challenged one. You know that President Obama got exactly one piece of legislation through, which related to the Congo, and he hasn't enforced it since he's been in office. So. He's very good with these ones for a person to be such an exceptional, bright, shining star. The replacement for Martin Luther King, he seems to operate in single digits. Uh, would you would you concur that there seem to be a lot of single digits for the president, uh, at least from your vantage point of working for the EEOC? I think after you know I was taken in by him, I did some research, and the former Black Panther and congressional uh, uh, elected representative from the district that Obama ran for Bobby who beat Rush. him Bobby Rush who was a former Black Panther individual when he when Obama was running against him and he beat Obama he said Obama ain't black enough right now I, you know, I took that kind of strange at first but now in context and in retrospect I think he isn't black enough but then he ran for the Senate but he didn't legitimately win the Senate seat the individual who, who lost to him, a Republican, this multi-millionaire Republican, and his wife was on Deep Space Nine or Star Trek. He was that real nice built female blonde that was on you know Star Trek or Deep Space Nine. He was taking his wife to these sexual clubs and basically having uh, letting his wife have sex with other men in these sexual clubs. And it came out that uh, he was doing that. So he withdrew from the race against Obama, and Obama ran uh, virtually against nobody, and that's how he got into the Senate, okay. and that's how he got to the presidency. He ran, he ran against Alan Keyes, who is the uh, um, Let Me Play Boss uh, right. Republican candidate. They, they look for places where there's no one to run, and they yeah. put... Uh, Mr. Keys, uh, but I'm talking about the white guy that got out before he was only left against Keys, and Keys was not really a candidate to really be running against. Well, but he, there was a white rich he, he guy. Got, he got votes and he got support from the Republican right. Party right. to basically be use a slave to kill a slave strategy of the right. Republican Party. Right. So he he did run, but he ran against a non Chicagoan, which to me is quite strange. But he ran against someone. Uh, I think. What helped Obama to win in the city of Chicago was the the association with Jeremiah Wright's church, the same person that he uh, he done he well he did the Judas on and uh, and uh, ironically uh, Mr. Uh, Obama uh, 
who was the beneficiary of the political and moral ethical largesse of Jeremiah Wright has none of the moral stature of Mr. Wright or Reverend Dr. Wright. Reverend Dr. Wright is a major uh, figure theologically, historically, and otherwise everywhere. Uh, he did the Judas on this man and I thought that that it's ironic that he even got the Senate seat mm -hmm. through this relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he stabbed Jeremiah Wright in the back, mm -hmm. and he probably twisted the knife around a few times, uh, that to me was, for me, clear enough that there would be no mercy for even those who had helped him that were black. And so I, I remain intrigued by people who were impressed. <laughs> and was still drinking the Kool-Aid, unsweetened, maybe there was some Nutri-Sweet, but it certainly wasn't real sugar, the kind we like, or they were having unsweetened tea. And our folks don't drink unsweetened tea normally, even when we have diabetes. But I, uh, we'll move on to that. Well, I, I want to say this. I, I want to go back to the skin bleaching stuff that said was said about Obama. I think that that's the key there. You know, you know, when you have self hatred to a point where, you know, you feel you need he he saw in a magazine that there was some cream that he could bleach his skin to be white, tells the story. Right? He he wanted to be white. And I, and I think that that has has always affected him and I think he had some issues with his father and uh I mean you know obviously, you know, I mean I'm I'm not a a a a, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, right? I mean, I, I can't analyze him, but I'm going to say this, right, that, uh, um, you know, he, he wants to receive the benefits of looking black, but he wants to pander to uh, white status quo, which he does. I have right? a question in relationship to his father. Do you believe his story that the only thing he ever got from his father was a basketball? Does that sound like an invention? I'm thinking his father was from a country where they play uh, football, right. soccer, mm -hmm. why would a man from a country where soccer is the main sport give someone a basketball? I almost felt like that could be some racial stereotype, but it's a, a, a mismatched metaphor to get a Kenyan to give an American a basketball versus a soccer ball. I, I can't prove my sense that there's mm -hmm. something awry with mm -hmm. that story. But your take on that, well, does that sound like something, a, a self-hatred story? Well, I, you know, I mean, the I only mean, thing I got from my father was a basketball. I, th I think when, when you, you look at the pictures of Obama in the village that his father came from, he didn't look happy. He didn't look happy to me. You know, I mean, he looked unhappy. He didn't look like he was proud to be there. I, I don't think that he understood that, that what the village took to get his father to Hawaii to go through this college and to he he was sent there to, to gain knowledge to go back to Kenya to help his people. Not to not to me to have a relationship with, with, with a, 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 a Caucasian young lady and, and and then stay there. They 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 sacrificed a lot to get him to the Americas to gain this knowledge to come back to Kenya to help his people. And I think that eventually that was the driving force. Now, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a product of a broken home, too. I mean, I can, I, I can be mad at my father, too. But I don't know how much mad I can be at my father if, if, if the reason why he abandoned me was he had to go back and help his people who had, who had fronted the money for him to get an education to help bring them out of poverty. I mean, how mad could I really be at him at that I, point? I don't know if they funded him money in as much as the pipeline to bring Africans in the early 60s to the United States to become essentially collaborators with the American empire if they paid anything. I just don't think that the average rural Kenyan could, first of all, get a passport out right. of the country at the period of time where the British were repressing the uh, Kenyan population because they were transition from being a colony to a neo-colonial protectorate that they would have the money. So I challenge people to be very careful of believing Mr. Obama's narrative. I believe any superficial research on history at that time would find uh, most of what he said in terms of Kenya quite suspect in as much as he hadn't been there a lot to know the fact that his father was recruited by Tom Boyer. Tom Boyer was a CIA asset, which means he didn't pay to go to school. And I don't find it unique at all that a person who's being recruited to be an anti-communist allied to the United States meets a white woman in a Russian class I, and in Hawaii in 1960. This sounds more or less a plan versus something that was atypical. So there's a lot that I absolutely 
disagree with. Forgive me for interrupting you. I just yeah. uh, personally, having supported the best African American candidate for president in mm-hmm. 2008, who was Cynthia Ann McKinney, mm-hmm. who got more votes than what's reported. I'm certain of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's someone whose history we can check and we can verify. Mm-hmm. And she did not get a fair review. Mm-hmm. And yet a person who's strange and unknown to us, mm-hmm. we haven't even bothered to even critique or look at mm-hmm. uh, his own recount of his own life. I'll add this so it can be yeah. said. Right. His mother, who, grandmother, who's allegedly so mm-hmm. racist, mm-hmm. if she was so racist, Mm-hmm. I question seriously that she'd let an African man impregnate her daughter and go off to Harvard and not do something about it. Mm-hmm. That's atypical of white supremacist mm-hmm. <laughs> attitudes in white women. I think that maybe the family would have had that guy hurt mm-hmm. or jailed or forced to pay child support mm-hmm. versus looking the other way. So I, yeah. I have my doubts right. about this woman mm-hmm. who took this child and raised him when the mother's traipsing all over the planet mm-hmm. as being this doctrinaire racist. I believe mm-hmm. this was Mr. Obama's uh, invented way to sort of say he mm-hmm. could connect or relate to African Americans. And I'll, I'll stop there. I don't mind who right. doesn't like what well, I've said. Well, I, I, you know, I tell you, I'm not an authority on him. You know, my, my, my real issue is, is that I was at the EEOC. The expectation was we were going to go back to enforcing the rule of law and civil rights, which we hadn't been doing for the past eight years. And um, I honestly had an expectation that that was going to happen because this was an individual that was a Harvard law professor and was an employment lawyer, and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. What happened was the racist bigots at the EEOC sped up their racist bigoted practices and, and, and taking bribes and throwing cases against African Americans when Obama took over. They did not slow down. They sped up. So that means to me they had some in, inside information that he was soft on race issues ahead of time. And I want to give you a, a parallel example. Mr. Obama sponsored a bill to hold companies accountable for human rights violations and issues in the Congo that's never been enforced even once since he's been in office. But it's interesting. The day that he was during his inaugural The violence in Congo started. It coincided with the inaugural celebrations, meaning that the people in Africa who butchered some six million people understood that they had nothing to fear from a black Kenyan-American president, I don't call him African-American president, that he would do very little to look out for the lives of millions of Africans. And we've seen the unfolding of this policy and the murder of, uh, and, and assassination of a whole country of Libya, the assassination of Ivory Coast, the drones that kill anywhere from 60 to 100 innocent Somali civilians, the drone bases being built. So I think everyone was looking at him, except for us. We were caught up in the hype. To quote Public Enemy, it says, don't believe the hype, and we put our fingers in our ears. You know, I I know this, right? And I know a little bit about African history and not a whole lot. But they they had a similar situation that went on between uh, Patrice Lumumba and Mobutu Sese Seko, right? Patrice Lumumba was the first prime minister of the independent Congo nation after the Belgians left out of the Congo. And they were very repressive colonial individuals that did a lot of genocide against Congolese people. And what they did was to undermine... Patrice Lumumba's uh, a progressive and uh, um, great thinking, great leader of African people, um, they used an individual by the name of Mobutu Sese Seko. And Joseph Kansavubu. And Joseph Kansavubu to basically uh, kill and assassinate and chop Mobutu, I mean, uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba into pieces. And then they ended up running the Congo. And, and, and when you think about Joseph Stalin and the number of Russians that he killed, you need to think about Mobutu Sese Seko, who killed ungodly numbers of Congolese people, you know, because he was a repressive dictator. And, it, and, it, and it's amazing that, that that part of Africa is the part of Africa where uh, um, Obama's father evolved from. So, it's you know... Kenya, so it's, yeah, it's near. But it's near. And, 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 you know, it's a lot of betray, betrayal of black people betraying black people and being used by colonial countries to uh, uh, subvert other black people. 
And basically what's going on here is, is we have a mulatto society that if you're a half caste, and I mean half caste means you're half white and half black, that you're in the ruling class. And that ruling class has been anointed as the people to perpetrate the uh, colonial uh, beliefs uh, 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 of this country on African Americans. And we're being held down now by the half caste. We're not being held down by the white people anymore. The white people can go home because the half caste is going to keep the black people, the darker black people, in line because they're half white. And they are the ruling society. And I think if you take a hard look at, at the people in, in his administration, a good number of them are half caste. I want to ask you, as our last sector and segment comes, uh, if you could do a top 10 or bottom 10, if you would, or bottom 50 in some sort of order, the worst places in the country in terms of the EEOC. Of course, it's bad everywhere, but some particular nightmare regions uh, uh, at your choice. They don't have to be ranged. They don't have to be arranged in order of importance or which one is the worst. But if I'm watching this, and I, let's say I live in Salt Lake City, or wherever. I might be in a place where it's it's hellish, but it's not super hellish. Where are some of the worst places in the country? For I would say the worst place for bribery and corruption is New York, New York City. The New York District Office is the worst. The, the second worst place is Atlanta, Georgia, right? Because all the employees from the Atlanta, Georgia District Office were brought to New York and trained how to be a corrupt and how to uh, uh, be involved in the conspiracy against black people. And, and Atlanta's allegedly the black mecca, and it's got a really... It's the worst e second worst EEOC in the country, and they only second because they were trained by the, pe the, the racist bigots in New York City. And then they took the, the third, I, I, I would say, is uh, uh, Los Angeles, California. And the reason why I say the third is, is because the former district director in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, if you can't find race discrimination in New Orleans, Louisiana, right, where they have the passe blonde and, and they got more racism, bigotry, any other place in the country, right, then you can't find it nowhere. And the district director that was down there is a guy by the name of Opus Perry. Opus Perry never found race discrimination the whole time that he was in New Orleans, and he was there for a long time, right? And he's a lawyer. But, but he did such a good job of not finding race discrimination in New Orleans, Louisiana, that they promoted him and made him the district director of Los Angeles, California. Okay. So now... So he's a Christopher Columbus of, of, that's of right. racial discrimination. Now you understand how the EEOC works. If you do a good job at, 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 not, at, saying. at not seeing race discrimination, you get promoted and moved around the country. You know, Ray Charles missed his calling, you suspect. Yeah, that's exactly Maybe right. Maybe Stevie Wonder could have been a director. Right, but Opus Perry is, I'm telling you, other than Spencer Lewis, which 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 is a very racist, bigoted individual, he had basically been a very corrupt district director, black district director in New York for a long time. But, I mean, as a result of my complaints, at least he got moved from New York to Philadelphia. So now he lives in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia is a bad place. Right. So Philadelphia is a bad place because he's trying to get a judgeship either in the county or the city or the state of Philadelphia so he can practice his racist, bigoted practices against black people. You think he'll prisons like the other judges that were putting in people? You know, I mean, he's been brought up on charges for, for sexual harassment of, of EEOC employees and taking bribes before and it's been covered up. What about Chicago? Chicago is pretty bad also. It is very, very bad. I'd say that was the fourth worst place. In, no, the fourth worst place is, is, uh, is North Carolina. And that's under a guy by the name of Reuben Daniels. And, and, I mean, he's pretty bad. I mean, he is really, really bad. And uh, Reuben Daniels is, is on the line of Spencer Lewis, Clarence Thomas, and Opus Perry. They, they move these guys around quite a bit. And, uh, and North Carolina is really having a hard time because of Reuben Daniels, which is another black lawyer that basically is practicing uh, um, non-rule of law against black people. And they keep him down there because he do, does a damn good job of it. Chicago. And, uh, so, and, and Chicago might be number five. And any other areas? What about Florida? Is, Florida is pretty bad. I'm going to talk to you about Florida. Florida is very bad because basically what they did was they put a uh, Puerto Rican in charge of a Cuban area. And, you know, Puerto Ricans and Cubans don't really get along. Right. So why would you put a Puerto Rican in charge of a Cuban area? Well, this guy was on a take. His name was Constales, right? And, and this guy uh, was basically taking money, right? 
and he retired uh, in lieu of investigation. And uh, basically, the real people that are having a hard time in uh, Southern Florida are the Haitians. The Haitians are being discriminated against all the time. They, they're forced to take an AIDS test just to work in the food service industry. Now, why only Haitians have to take AIDS tests to work in food services? That's a means to discriminate against them so that they don't go work there and they can hire Cubans and other people to take those jobs. Given the gay population in South Beach, it would right. be fair that everyone Everyone. We should have to take it, but why just the Haitians? And why haven't the EEOC had a class action investigation against the, the food industry and the unions in South Florida? Why? Because the fix is in and black people don't count and the Haitians, it's all right to discriminate against Haitians in South Florida. And matter of fact, Florida, Tampa Bay is where my buddy Clyde Lochin, who took the bride from Ralph Lauren Polo, right, to, to, to go to his steel drum club, he's a mediator. He's been promoted. What about the Baltimore, Washington area? This is allegedly the uh, paradise ghetto. Let me country. give you the, the, the 411 on the uh, Baltimore, Washington area, right? Uh, that's the area that is covered by Senator Barbara McCluskey, who, who I gave the information about the racial corruption and bigotry and bribery going on at the EEOC. But she's a very shrewd lady. She's been in office maybe 40 years as a senator, maybe 30 years as a senator. I'm not sure. But, but she's Polish. She's Polish, right? It's, and she has a very large African American constituency. See, but guess what? She, you know, African Americans keep voting for her, even though in reality she's not for uh, affirmative rights for black people. She's for keeping a corrupt EEOC open. They wanted to close the Baltimore field office because they don't do anything for black people. Anybody from Baltimore knows that the EEOC does nothing for black people in Baltimore, and they were going to close the office. She stopped them from closing the office because the corrupt lawyers needed to get paid, and they were on the payroll of the EEOC, so she kept it open. It's not like she, they're helping black people in the community. They're not doing that. They're just helping lawyers to get paid that know about the corruption, so she kept the office open so that lawyers can get paid, and she didn't care about the black community because everybody knows in Baltimore the, black, uh, the EEOC doesn't do anything for, for black people. I mean, everybody St. St. Louis. St. Louis is, is, is bad, but the Washington field office is, is pre pretty bad too. I mean, you guys had an issue here with a woman with dreads, couldn't go to work at Six Flags. Where was the class action against Six Flags on Central Avenue that everybody knew that they said they didn't want any uh, women with dreads to work at Six Flags? Prince George's County. In PG um, County. Well, well well, they like for you to say Prince George's. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're mm -hmm. they're they're so special there. Yeah. Uh, and Prince George's County is perhaps representative of a county with a large number of suburbanized blacks who believe they've made it, who run from uh, ethnic racial issues. Uh, so I, I could see that mm -hmm. being the case. But you haven't given me one for Washington, although I mean, well, I mean, so Washington is Washington is 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 pretty pretty bad. But you would figure there was a time when the d district director for Washington D.C. was a guy by the name of Tulio um, Tulio Diaz. I mean, why would they put a Hispanic in charge of the Washington field office? Did that make sense? I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, it didn't make sense to me. I mean, Washington is 85% uh, you know black town, and you put a Hispanic in charge of the Washington field office. I mean, um, okay, so for, for for the Southwest, do they put blacks over Latinos? Do they switch up and do different things? Well, have certain ethnic groups. What I would tell you about the Southwest, they got a serious problem in the Phoenix district office. I know that they have a lawsuit against the uh, the, the uh, investigators have filed a, a discrimination lawsuit against the uh, uh, Phoenix district office and Jacqueline Barons of the EEOC. But, you know, that doesn't come out, um, you know, and uh, what they've done is there was a, a, a very prejudiced or a very corrupt um, um, manager that was moved from the Buffalo. Buffalo was a very bad place also, too, but it was moved from Buffalo. Uh, her name is Issa Cadles, right? They use the overtime money. The EEOC says they got this great backlog of complaints, mainly black complaints, and they can't get to them. Well, they're budgeted for overtime. Why don't they pay the investigators overtime to investigate the backlog? Never did. Never did. So what were they doing with the, the money that was budgeted for overtime? They were taking it and giving it to managers to stay in, in the Millennium Hotel in New York City. Flew Issa Cadles, who was a manager that got promoted that shouldn't have got promoted. And Issa? Is she Muslim? I don't know what she is. I think she's Hispanic. But they flew her from Buffalo to New York 
and back and forth on a weekly basis, put her up in one of the top hotels in Manhattan on overtime money. What was she doing in the hotel? She was just sleeping there because she didn't want to leave her home in Buffalo to go work in New York City. So they flew her back and forth with overtime money, overtime money that was allocated for the backlog, which n never was used for investigators to to uh, give to 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 investigate the backlog. And uh, but but she was brought into New York as the coordinator for the alternative dispute unit, but she didn't want to leave her home in Buffalo, so they took overtime money and flew her back and forth from Buffalo to New York City and put her up in the Millennium Hotel, which is one of the top hotels in New York City at the World Trade Center, where the old World Trade Center was. But even though she got overtime money that wasn't allocated for that purpose, guess what? She got promoted again. Now she is the deputy director in the Phoenix district office, right? So here's somebody who abused overtime money at the EEOC, who's gotten two promotions, now she's the deputy director in the Phoenix office. So, I mean, th this is the shell game that's going on at the EEOC. Oakland, Bay Area. The California office is so bad, and I, and I mean, it, it is, it, there's some things going on out in California. The employment laws for the state of California are so repressive, from what I've heard, right, because I didn't work out there, uh, are so repressive, it's unbelievable what's going on there, but just take it with a grain of salt that if they brought Oprah's Perry in from New Orleans, Louisiana, because he could never find race discrimination, then why did they bring him to California? And the Oakland office is is known for, you know, basically uh, doing well at federal sector complaints. They have a, a system out there of manipulating federal sector complaints. And a lot of lawyers at the EEOC don't have law licenses, but they had expired law licenses in California. So there's some trick with law licenses in California. You know, the, the, the OPM says that all government lawyers must have law licenses, right? Well, the EEOC has 25 administrative judges that have expired law licenses. If you have an expired law license, you can't practice law in the federal they're, government. But they're doing it anyway. But they're doing it anyway because Eleanor Holmes Norton created the administrative judges that doesn't exist. There's a thing in the federal registry for administrative law judges. Only the EEOC has administrative judges. But they have 25 judges that don't have law licenses that are adjudicating federal sector complaints. And they have explained the way to Congress because, you know, um, Ms. Patty Murray, who's the head of the committee that oversees the EEOC, really doesn't understand that you've got to have a law license to, to practice law in the federal government. So, you know, I mean, the EEOC basically is an outlaw rogue agency with the first lady's girlfriend in charge of it that won't be held accountable. I mean, it, this is unbelievable, right? What's the term girlfriend? How are you interpreting that? She's uh, Michelle Obama's Harvard Law School friend, and she's Yvette Clark, the representative from the Brooklyn 11th District's uh, undergraduate uh, friend, right? So, I mean, th this is a friendship thing. Now we're showing that black people are just as corrupt, or half-caste black people are just as corrupt as white people because they're hiring their friends. Now, I had somebody say to me the other day that, but she's qualified. What makes Jacqueline Barron's qualified to be the head of the EEOC? Because she worked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where um, Benjamin Gillis, who is a half-caste individual himself, right, has said that uh, the NAACP is no longer enforcing uh, uh, race discrimination. They want all people, all poor people, to get jobs. And if all poor people get jobs, black people will end up getting Black poor people would end up getting jobs too. I didn't know it was the NAACP's charter to make sure that all poor people get jobs and then black but, people would benefit from but, all poor but people. But the NAACP jobs. is not colored people means colored people. So actually, he's speaking on an organization created by uh, the advancement uh, of colored people. No, it, it created by Jews to benefit, and I'm just going to call it like it is mostly Jewish money with some. By the way, fairly light-skinned people who created that organization. Uh, we're going to conclude this, but I wanted to simply ask you to uh, share with those who are viewing your your blog that that address and something about your organization, and mm -hmm. perhaps take a minute to mm -hmm. give your concluding thoughts. A minute too. Okay. Well, my my personal blog is. Uh, EEOC, EEOC, excuse me, it's www.eeocorruption.org. 
blogsport.com. Okay. All right. And if you had something that you wanted to urgently mm -hmm. say to people, I, I would say that, that everybody needs to protest to the president, to the elected officials, to shut down the EEOC. Period. Because it's just a hustle for the corrupt attorneys and corrupt managers uh, at the EEOC to make money off of the pain and suffering of people of this country. Even white people are getting scammed at the EEOC. The EEOC basically is not litigating anything against any corporations, period, anymore. With that, we thank you, uh, Mr. Ricardo Jones, for sharing some very troubling and insightful information on a government agency per your dis description certainly not serving uh, the people. Our money, again, is being collected through taxes and not serving us. On behalf of Dignity Reports, on behalf of Dignity, uh, our First Lady, the Honorable Cynthia McKinney, and Education for Peace, we hope that you take this to heart, uh, blog this, share this, make people aware that you really have no, no agency looking out for your rights, irrespective of your color. We are done.